from Bitcoin, blockchain or distributed ledger technology to cryptocurrencies, tokens and initial coin offerings. It seems everyone involved has something to say, but can you really trust their advice? One man's had enough of weasel words and charlatans and is ready to give you impartial, independent analysis. With digestible blockchain bytes, ICO analysis and need-to-know news on cryptocurrencies, author, speaker, transparency and clarity advocate and award-winning software innovator, Barry James brings you Radio ICO. Hello, and today I'm delighted to be with J.R. Willett, the father of the ICO. Uh, we'll, we'll explain in a moment. But uh, uh, J.R., th- thank you for agreeing to, uh, to this, this chat today, and welcome. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so would, before we kind of get into uh, where we are right now and, uh, and, and Bitcoin and, and, and ICOs and, and, and how the two join and where we we go next. Would you just tell me a little bit about your background, please? Sure. Um, I am a software developer by trade. I first got into Bitcoin in 2010. At that time, I was researching payment methods. Uh, I was interested in chargebacks. And as soon as I saw Bitcoin, um, I had been dabbling in penny stocks. And I, I recognized the potential for a speculative bubble and got very excited, not only about what Bitcoin could do, but also the psychological component of the insanity that could come about. And uh, I think, if anything, I underestimated the insanity that that, that could come about. Um, so I was, I was really excited about it. I told my wife all about it. Actually, I told everybody about it that would listen to me until I, people got tired of hearing about it. Um, at that time, uh, I had two children and one on the way, and my wife was not real interested in me dabbling in magic internet money. So we actually had an ongoing discussion about this for months. Uh, and finally, um, finally, she got so tired of it, she, she, my, my birthday came around, and Christmas is around the time of my birthday, and she said, here, here's $200. You can flush it down the toilet if you want to. And so I ended up investing that in what I would call a mining scheme. Uh, I got other people to run the Bitcoin mining software on my behalf. Um, I paid them to do that, kids all over the the country. I recruited them on Craigslist, and in fact, they did not know they were running the Bitcoin mining software. I had disguised it. Uh, And uh, so I did some Bitcoin mining throughout 2011, um, and then I got very interested in where where Bitcoin would be going next, and I wanted to be involved with that, and that project that I started uh, ended up being the project that did the first token sale or what today they call the initial coin offering. Yeah. And you you kind of talk about the craziness that you saw, like it was a good thing. I mean, tell me about that. Okay. So it's a good thing in the terms, in the opportunities, right? I mean, anytime people are behaving strangely, there are opportunities. Um, And, uh, and there were then, I, I remember people lamenting on the Bitcoin forum that the price had gone from under a penny to 25 cents. And this was clearly a speculative bubble. This was clearly going to end in tears. Uh, How could anything go up 25 fold in such a short amount of time? Uh, So, and I remember looking at that and thinking, (laughs) this could go so much higher. Uh, You know, and and you started, I started doing things like making little graphs, right? Little bubble graphs of all the money in the world. And how big is the bubble for Bitcoin compared to all the money in the world? It turns out, it's infinitesimally small, at least it was in 2010. Mm. It was only worth a few million dollars. And there's trillions of dollars moving around every day in all these financial markets. And I started thinking, wow, if we started building tools that would attract those trillions of dollars into cryptocurrency, and that was what really got me excited. If if we could build those tools, there's really no upper bound. I mean, eventually, the, the upper bound is all the money in the world, right? Where all the money in the world just sort of gets sucked into cryptocurrency like a black hole. And of course, that has societal implications, upheaval, all sorts of terrible things could happen. But that that potential was what excited, attracted me to it. Yeah, and of course, now I think today we were about six thousand three hundred dollars for a bitcoin. So it's got, a, it's yeah. got an awful long, awful long way since. But to kind of yeah. go back to to then. So, so you uh, you I think 
produced a white paper, which was a very early white paper. Yes, yes, uh, 2012, I, I actually, very early in 2012, published a white paper about where, how I thought we could build a protocol layer on top of Bitcoin. Yeah. I, I didn't think of Bitcoin as money or as payment system. I thought of it as, as a structure that I could build on, and I could build new features on top of it. Uh, and that comes from kind of a computer science uh, mindset of, of seeing protocols as layering on top of each other. And we do that all the time when we don't even think about it. You know, your Ethernet card, Ethernet is a protocol. And on top of that, right, we run TCP IP, the protocol of the Internet. And on top of that, we run HTTP, the protocol of the web, and they stack on top of each other. Yeah. So I wanted to stack a protocol on top of Bitcoin. And I didn't really have any way to pay for it. And so... I didn't really think of it as all that revolutionary to just say, hey, here's a Bitcoin address, here's my white paper, you guys can send me some money if you think what I'm doing is interesting. But that is literally what people do all the time now. and Billions of dollars are being raised with that exact idea. Um, so it turns out to be the people, the thing I tend to be most famous for is not the smart contracts and the things that I was so excited about, it tends to be people say, oh, he did the first initial coin offer. <laughs> yeah. I, I, oh, and it looks I, like we're, our uh, connection just went unstable. Sorry. Did okay. my audio come through there? Do you need me to, to it, say it again? Yeah, no, let's carry on. Um, sure. This is fascinating. Um, so, so not only doing the first coin offering, which actually took you a while to talk yourself into that, I believe. Um, yeah. I actually came up with the idea. Uh, well, I wanted someone else to do it. I, I, I was hoping someone else would do it. I, that's why I didn't do it right away. Um, you know, from 2012, when I published that white paper, people talked about it, but nobody did it. And I was literally, literally saying things like, uh, if will someone please do this so I can send you my Bitcoins. I want to be a passive like, I want an investor. I just want to see you know, what happens with this. I don't want to do it myself. I didn't want to be in charge of all the money. I didn't want to you know, hire people. And you know, I, I, I thought my, my skills were more as a coder than as a entrepreneur. And uh, finally, I just got tired of waiting. Um, nobody was doing it. I went to a conference in San Jose in 2013 and I talked about this. People seemed really excited about it. And I thought, you know, maybe I should just do it. Yeah. And so that was the launch of what was then called MasterCoin. Today it's called Omni. And Omni was successful. Um, it is successful. There's over a half a billion dollars worth of coins that run on Omni as the protocol now. And I'm very proud of the team that built that. Um, you know, we, we, we did end up hiring people and we did end up building the protocol that I hoped we would build. And uh, there's a lot more I would like to build. But, uh, you know, what we built is very useful and, and people use it. So I'm very proud of, proud of the team that did that. Yeah, absolutely. I think, though, that going, just keeping, you know, at that moment early on or that time early on, um, the, the idea of running an ICO was, wasn't entirely obvious. In fact, it was probably non-obvious. And, uh, and that sequence of I have this idea that I think could help people and change the world, um, yeah. I, you know, I wonder if I can get other people on board with me. Um, yeah maybe I ought to do something about it. Um, it, it is, in, in essence, at the heart of crowdfunding as well. But I yeah. don't think you got it from there by the sounds of it. Maybe it was in the ether, I don't know. Well, it was partly, I mean, you know, I was aware of things like Kickstarter, you know, and I, I sort of knew that, that there, were, there were people that were having an idea and getting other people to pay for it without doing, going to venture capitalists and without... Um, you know, going through all the work of doing, you know, a securities offering. You know, I knew there were people that had found ways to do that. And so I was sort of aware that there were workarounds for this sort of like, I need to raise some money to build a thing. And, you know, and a lot of the ways to raise money are really onerous. Uh, so that was my model that I started from mentally. Um, and I didn't really think of it as all that different from a Kickstarter. However, as soon as I published it, people were saying things to me like, you're going to go to jail. You just you just released a security. And in fact, people told me that they had informed the SEC. I don't know, maybe the SEC has a web form that you can tattle on people or something. But yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I was, I was literally getting messages like, I, I informed the SEC about your illegal securities offering and I'll see you in jail. And yeah. it really concerned me, you know, because I, yeah. <laughs> I have children. I didn't want to be dragged off in the middle of the night by the yeah, SEC yeah. SWAT band. So you know, that, was, uh, yeah. that was concerning. And I don't think if I had spoke to a lawyer, I don't think any lawyer 
given that it had never been done before. Lawyers don't like things yeah. that have never been done before. With, with that in mind, I don't think I could have found a single lawyer in the world who would have approved it, you know, and said, yeah, go ahead and do that. Uh, so it, it was really just naivete and um, a, a little bit of foolhardiness that meant yeah. that I was the first one to ever do it. Although now there are lawyers who devote their entire careers and, and law firms have whole departments dealing with this now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and of course, now they will tell you, you know, the different ways that you can um, hopefully not uh, be a security and in fact uh, be a u utility token is a lot of times what they refer yeah. to it as now. Well, as far as I can tell, and uh, I'm pretty pretty sure about this, um, you, uh, you appear to have invented uh, crowdfunding 2.0, which <laughs> is a, an order of magnitude or maybe two uh, up there. Um, and I don't, you probably don't know too much about our struggles in the UK to, to get regulatory sanity yeah. <laughs> around equity crowdfunding and so on. And we've made a little progress and we've got a lot more to make. But uh, it crosses so many boundaries. So, so I'm, 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 you know, very excited about the future. Would you talk to us a little bit about where we are now and the future? Oh yeah. Um, so, I tend to be a little bit of a pessimist. I, if you look, if you look at the world of of cryptocurrency, you will find a lot of. Um, raging optimists, people that think that the world is going to be this beautiful utopia. And I don't, and I think it will be wonderful for a lot of people that happen to be interested in cryptocurrency or happen to have got into it early. Uh, I think a lot of people will be hurt by the rise of cryptocurrency. And it's not that cryptocurrency is, is bad. I think it's that the disruption to fiat currency will cause people a lot of problems. And now I tend to be one of those people that that kind of sees it as a as an either or, either cryptocurrencies take off and eventually are recognized as superior to fiat currencies and replace them, or they fade out. I don't really see an in between of those two alternatives, and that means uh, if cryptocurrencies take over, then a lot of people that are slow to adopt could be could be harmed by that, uh, and there's not a really good way reason to uh, um, an, a good way to avoid that that I know of, other than hopefully. Uh, human kindness among all of us, and I hope there will be some of that. Um, so uh, that's my view of blockchain in general. It, it tends to be uh, optimistic about what that blockchain will succeed, and pessimistic about the pain and suffering that will come out come about from that. Now, for initial coin offerings in general, I think there will continue to be regulatory hurdles. Uh, the, it, the best we can hope for is a sort of um, laissez-faire, you know, uh, only only um, going after the most flagrant frauds, you know, that would be, I think, the best outcome. The worst case outcome would be something along the lines of a crackdown. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen that some com countries take a very antagonistic approach to um, initial coin offerings, and I hope that will not spread to other com countries, because in their, their concerns are very valid, right? There are a ton of scams out there. Um, but you can lose your money in a lot of ways. You could go to a casino to lose your money. At least with the, something like a token sale, you know, if you do your homework, you maybe have a chance that's better than, you know, the, the obviously always against you odds at a casino. So, um, you know, it's an exciting world. And some really good projects got funded that way. Now that, you know, Ethereum and Omni, the one that I started, um, are good examples of that. And that, and I would have, it would be very sad to see the next, you know, great idea like that not be able to, um, to reach the world, uh, to let the world participate in it just because yeah. of these concerns over these scams. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that uh, we've advocated in the UK, and as you know, we've We've got what is generally accepted to be quite a good regime um, mm -hmm. as a result is the, the, the recognition of, of the traceability mm -hmm. and, and the transparency of identity uh, yes. involved. And, and that has uh, demonstrably a huge impact on the type and need for regulation. Is that something that you see too? Um. I've got to be careful what I say about that, uh, because because one of the the fundamental things that attracted me to cryptocurrency was the potential for anonymity. Now, 
in practice, that doesn't often, it's, it's to some degree, it, it is anonymous. Uh, with, with Bitcoin in particular, there's, you know, as you say, it's very public. You can trace the money from point A to point B. However, someone who's intent on anonymity can uh, be anonymous, usually, if they know what they're doing. Sorry, and there be, aren't be specific. I was thinking in particular about campaigns and ICOs. Oh, yes, yes. Them. And now, the, I think the, the market has definitely moved away from anonymous ICOs as far as like who's, who's running them being anonymous. Um, I don't see a lot of those anymore. And it's, and it's, it's good. You know, what, I think what we're seeing is the market is demanding uh, a degree of transparency. And uh, nobody's out there with a law saying, hey, I'm going to prosecute anybody who does an anonymous ICO. The reason that they're not being anonymous is because if you're anonymous, you don't raise any money. Yeah. So that's a good example of sort of the market correcting itself. Yeah. Uh, and I hope we'll see more things like that, more of this sort of self-policing. And uh, because the more the government feels like they have to regulate this, the less useful it will be. Yeah. Great. We're coming to the end of our, our time slot for, for this conference, and I'm sorry about that. Is there one, one more thing you'd like to say to people who are thinking of running an ICO or otherwise? Um, I guess if I've only got one more thing to say, I would say I'm really excited right now about um, ATMs, about uh, bringing crypto to you know the masses, people that... You know, those people that I talked about earlier that could be harmed by um, the, the decline of fiat currency. And I think ATMs are a great way to reach those people. And so um, I started UpToken is uh, what I'm currently working on. And uh, UpToken is, it's a, it's a token sale going on now. It's actually the first token sale I've been involved with since that first one years and years ago. Because there's not a lot of things that I get excited about. It has to be really fundamental and at a, at a level of... Um, what I call shovels in a gold rush. And I think of crypto ATMs as those shovels, which uh, if I'm selling shovels, is the analogy is I don't care where which hill the gold is in, right? Uh, and so I don't care which cryptocurrency takes off. I want to be involved with a project that succeeds regardless. And Uptoken for me is that project. So if your listeners are interested in what I'm doing currently, uptoken.org is, is my current passion. Great. And I'd like to talk to you some more about that uh, after this interview and uh, sure. over the next week or two. So, But again, thank you for making time for this, particularly at short notice uh, yeah. today, uh, JR. And uh, thank you again for your, for your work in, in, in creating ICOs in the first place. All right. It's nice talking to you. You too. You've been listening to me, Barry James, on ICO Radio. If you have a question that you'd like to pose for us, or if there's someone that you think we should uh, have on the show or interview, uh, or indeed you yourself would like to contribute to the show, please let us know. You can email us via podcast at ICO radio. That's ICO R A D dot I O. You can get the address from the show notes too. And we'd love to hear from you. But beyond that, thank you so much for listening to the show. And if you enjoyed it, please do leave us a review. ICO Radio was brought to you by author, speaker, transparency and clarity advocate and award-winning software innovator Barry James. Get in touch with the programme. Put yourself or someone else forward as a guest. Visit iconewsdesk.com. And if you've enjoyed the show, please leave a review. And don't forget to subscribe to get your next insights and interviews from the ICO Radio podcast.